This morning, may the words of my mouth and the collective meditation of our hearts simply be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Amen. So friends, this week we depart from our gospel lesson. And although you said that it was our first gospel, James is not in fact a gospel. For many, this departure needs some context. And I'm gonna begin with a little primer for some of us on the book of James. And it is for me too, I don't preach on James a lot. And I probably should more because he is kind of an adversary of Paul. James is considered New Testament wisdom literature. So like Proverbs or Ecclesiastes, it consists largely of moral exhortations. And as someone who likes kind of philosophy and moralist kind of literature, I, I kind of like James and it precepts a traditional eclectic nature. Oops, this is a problem with manuscripts. Pauline theology goes directly against the epistle of James for the following argument. James and the M source material in Matthew, and just ignore the M source. So we're just going to say that James and Paul disagree. We'll talk a little bit more about this, and I might go a little bit off script in a bit. In, in Matthew, in that they are unique in canon of their stance against the rejection of works and deeds. James is not against that. So James likes works. So he says that, you know, if faith alone is not enough. You got to do something with your faith. According to Sanders, traditional Christian theology wrongly divested the term works in its ethical grounding, part of the effort to characterize Judaism as legalistic. However, for James and for all Jewish people, faith is alive only through the observation of Torah. But I think there's more to it than that, right? To observe someone suffering and to just pray and do nothing about it, there's something deeply problematic in that. And it's not just the legalistic nature of the Torah that makes it problematic. It is that the witnessing of a neighbor's suffering and to just merely send thoughts and prayers. Not that we know anything about that, right? We haven't, <laughs> we haven't seen school shootings or pandemics or wars. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get political. Because the gospel is not political, right? But we haven't just sent thoughts and prayers to folks, have we, when they were suffering? So James isn't talking about just the observation of Torah alone. He's talking about witnessing, and I'll talk about dating in a minute here, extreme, extraordinary suffering and doing nothing. Sending thoughts and prayers. And today he's talking about prayer. And that's a problem. Here it's do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed by what they do. That's from James 1. The content of James is directly parallel in many instances to the sayings of Jesus, which are found in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. Scholars such as Luke Timothy Johnson suggest an early dating for the epistle of James. The letter of James also, according to the majority of scholars who have carefully worked through its text in the past two centuries, it seems like a long time, but it's not like in terms of scholarly work, 
is among the earliest of New Testament compositions. It contains no references to the events of Jesus's life, but it bears striking testimony to Jesus's words. Jesus's sayings are embedded in James. They're almost mirrored to the gospels. And they're embedded in James's exhortations in a form that is clearly not dependent on the written gospels. So if written by James, the brother of Jesus, so there's some discrepancies as to who James is. If written by James, the brother of Jesus, it would have been written sometime before AD 69 or 62 when he was martyred. So that's, that's early. The earliest extent of manuscripts of James usually date to mid to late third century and dated consensually around 65 to 85 CE. So the other author could be James the Just, a servant of God and brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like Hebrews, James is not so much a letter as an exhortation. The style of the Greek language text makes it unlikely that it was actually written by James, the brother of Jesus. And most scholars regard all the letters in this group potentially pseudonymous, meaning just attributed to the author. Now that's not the same problematic that we have with what happens in college today, where we plagiarize, right? Pseudonymous means that somebody wrote it and attributed it as like a follower, and that's a good thing. So we're not going to get into all of who this James is because it's contested and it's centuries and millennia old. What we are going to talk about is that James was a follower of Jesus and that James believed that faith and living out one's faith was a moral requisite, that you couldn't have faith and just kind of pray it away. Faith and prayer were actionable activities. We're going to just assume that those two things went hand in hand for James. So let's turn to today's scripture of James, and we're going to go to the message paraphrase. Prayer to be reckoned with. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the children together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master. Believing in prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you sin, you'll be forgiven inside and out. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other so that you can live together whole and heal. The prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Elijah, for instance, human, just like us. He prayed hard that it wouldn't rain and it didn't, not a drop for three and a half years. Then he prayed that it would rain and it did. The showers came and everything started growing again. My dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them. Get them back. And you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic from wandering away from God. Did any of you count how many times the word prayer was in that? Seven, lots of prayer, seven times. So no matter what conclusion we come to about who the author James is or was in that text, we can rest assured that this early writer was experiencing some internal conflict about what was going on in his time frame and what was happening in the early first century. The sheer amount of death 
and destruction, poverty. His holy temple was destroyed during that time frame. Imagine if our church was bulldozed and bombed and then bulldozed and bombed again. I kind of like this place. Disease and violence would have made anyone afraid and anxious. I see y'all in your masks. You know, Gail was just talking about teachers who are too afraid to go teach. We all know a little bit about anxiety. <laughs> I had my own anxiety just last week and missed the first service that I had missed calling in because of a sick day. Nowhere in this text does it say go to God prayer. You'll no longer have anxiety. That's not what James is saying. But more than 2,000 years later, we find ourselves with more in common with James than we might think. There's still war. And just because we just pulled out of one doesn't mean that there's no longer war. Just because we say, not it, doesn't mean that people around the globe are impacted by wars. There's still a global pandemic just because I got my vaccination. Just because your relationship's fine doesn't mean that everyone else's is. There's still poverty and human suffering beyond what any of us might imagine. How many of us find ourselves on our knees more in these past days, months, and years than ever before? I spoke with a board member, and I'm not going to tell you who, in an answer to prayer regarding our church finances these past few weeks that buy us some time with that North property. And for that joy, I am grateful. But does it mean that we're good forever? And we can just say, amen, God, we're good. We prayed and we have an answer, right? We're good. No. We still got work to do regarding that, right? I'm going to read. Of course, I didn't put it down here. Prayer is actionable, folks. We've got to participate in that. I talked to Matt about Carrie Newcomer, one of my favorite artists and songwriters. She writes, a shovel is a prayer to the farmer's foot. When he steps down and the soft earth gives way, a baby is a prayer. When it's finally asleep, a whispered, whew, amen at the end of the day. And a friend is a prayer when they bring over soup, when they laugh at your jokes and they don't ask for proof. It's a song that you sing when you're alone, when you're weary or lonely or that far from home. For all your searching, there's nothing to do that you've been looking for is looking for you. I'm the prodigal daughter, you're the dissident son. We've been washed in rainwater we're the fortunate ones on the other side of midnight, just before dawn. You can feel it coming when the long night's done. I receive a devotional each week from the Center for Action and Contemplation by Richard Rohr. He has lots of nuggets, but this week, prayer is not about changing God, but willing to let God change us. That joy for the North side was probably already in the works. We just didn't know about it, right? And our anxiety that was ramped up was as well. The world was always going to be chaos overflowing. We have zero control. I watched Ted Lasso. Lasso. Nil is what they say over there. We have nil control. 
I don't know how many of you have heard me tell of my grandmother saying, I pray for rain and God just gives me a gentle mist. <laughs> Rarely, folks, are we going to get a windfall here. We're always going to have to be co-creating and thinking of that next right step. Rural rights, prayer is looking out from a different set of eyes which are not comparing, competing, judging, labeling, or analyzing, but receiving the moment in its presence, wholeness and unwholeness. That is what is meant by contemplation. My kids, but it wasn't just my kids. I was a youth director at the time. The kids and I began serving food with artists helping the homeless. Car was pretty great, but it was winter in Kansas City at the time with community Christian church in 2012. So one afternoon, it was bitter cold out and snowing like it does only in Kansas City, Hugh. The folks wanted to cancel because of a huge snow drift across the median. If you're in Kansas City, there's kind of medians between the church and the park. But there are still homeless folks out there and we served afternoon, four o'clock, kind of an afternoon meal. And ultimately we decided to brave the weather, brave the weather, which I think is interesting because we were gonna get in our cars and go home. So it really wasn't that brave of us. <laughs> but we had soup and hot chocolate. The teens helping were bundled up and their teeth chattered and they were so cool. They could just, everyone was whining. So we bundled up, we wheeled the cart of hot soup, bread and hot chocolate across the street to JC Nichols Park. Our friends gathered. It was really, it's always really interesting when you serve homeless folks if you're out in the elements because everyone kind of pitches in. You kind of can't figure out or can't discern at some point if everyone's bundled up who's homeless and who's the volunteers and who's the pastor or the youth leader anymore. I mean, it's fear of the kids, obviously. But at some point, you really can't figure out who's serving who other than, you know, people are eating. So they picked up the cart and wheeled it over this kind of drift. And we get over there with the supplies across the piled snow. Kids seem to get warmer. Their conversations got livelier. Their hands and feet of Christ became the prayer of a meal served in the park that day. Eyes were open, perspective changed, teeth no longer seemed to chatter. I can pray for God to end homelessness, but ultimately God desires me to vote to change policies and feed my neighbors. I can pray for my dental bills to get paid and a new opportunity shows up for me to find a second revenue stream. And I met some friends and my life has changed in a different way, right? I'm always a part of God's plan. We co-create together. We learn new things. We couldn't have a funeral luncheon here at the congregational Fellowship Hall because we were hosting theater camp, but we did ministry in a different way, a prayer to do and host in a different way. We got to co-create with God. It doesn't sound as fun as making it rain with cash, does it? That's prosperity gospel. But goodness, aren't our stories more lively? Aren't our stories and narratives changing the way that we do? But it sure is consistent with a creator that created humanity in God's own image and said it is very good. And we learn to do things differently. Friends, as James says, we've got a lot of praying to do and prayer can change us. The Holy Spirit will guide us to what's next. And that's how James would invite us to think about prayer. Amen.